Chat with Traders, episode 122, is sponsored by TradeStation. TradeStation are a fully licensed, award-winning online broker and are a popular choice amongst professional traders. TradeStation also have an all-new favorable pricing structure that eliminates pretty much all fees for things like software and data. And now you only pay a flat rate of $5 on all stock trades. Learn more at tradestation.com slash traders. This is your key to the minds of trading's elite performers, those who profit in relentless markets. Here on the Chat with Traders podcast, you'll hear about the skill sets and tactics that lead winning traders to win so you can level up and become a better trader. Here's your host, Aaron Fifield. What's happening, crew? I trust you are doing well. Your host, Aaron Firefield here, and I have a very special guest on this episode who I'm excited to introduce, and that is Doug Sifu. Doug is the co-founder and CEO of Virtue Financial, one of the largest electronic market-making firms in the world. Around the clock, Virtue are trading in 12,000 instruments across 235 markets and 36 countries with only 140 staff. Virtue often trade more than 4.5 million times a day and prior to their IPO in 2015, Virtue reported the firm had made profit 1,277 days out of 1,278 days losing money just one day between 2009 and 2014. And in recent news, Virtue made headlines on the 20th of April 2017 after announcing their acquisition of rival Knight Capital Group for $1.4 billion. Also, well worth mentioning, Doug, along with his Virtue co-founder, Vincent Viola, are both co-owners of NHL team, the Florida Panthers. During this episode, Doug and I speak about the backstory of Virtue and the simple philosophy which has enabled the firm to scale rapidly, hitting singles and the law of large numbers, and Doug gives a few words for how others can reach high levels of success. You'll notice this episode is a little shorter than normal, but it's a good one in my humble opinion. So, I hope you dig it. Here is Doug Sifu. Let's get right into it. Before Virtue, you were a corporate lawyer, and from what I've read, you were a very good one. Uh, you did this for around about 17 to 18 years. How did you go from working as a lawyer to becoming involved in financial markets? Sure. So, it's an interesting question. and You know, I always tell people uh, a bit of luck, but uh, you do make your own luck in life. So, as you said, I was a corporate lawyer at a law firm here in Manhattan, kind of a big prominent law firm called Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Ward, and Garrison International Law Firm. I had the opportunity, one of my biggest, probably my biggest client was a private equity firm named General Atlantic, which is a big global private equity firm, you know, and they uh, hit upon this investment thesis, I'll say, you know, 99, 2000-ish, which was that the financial services industry, particularly like the exchange space, if you will, and the electronic trading space was going to become further electronified and there would be an opportunity to uh, assist through, you know, equity capital and, you know, cajoling to transform exchanges, broadly speaking, from cooperative uh, member organizations where a couple hundred mostly white men stood in the ring and screamed at each other into, you know, uh, more for-profit uh, automated electronic venues. And that was kind of their thesis. And so they embarked and I did all the deals. They embarked on a series of transactions and I'll, I'll screw up the particular order where they looked at, you know, uh, the BMNF in Brazil, they invested in, they invested in Archipelago, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the transactions that they in invested in was pre a pre IPO investment in the New York mercantile exchange. And uh, the chairman at the time was a guy by the name of Vinny Viola. And so I met Vinny, who's now my partner, and we started Virtue together uh, kind of on the opposite side of the table. But I was introduced as a lawyer first to the electronic trading and market making space uh, because of my relationship with John Atlantic. And so I got a broad view of how the markets were changing, you know, I would argue, for the better. 
both on the equities and the commodities side, particularly with, with the NYMEX investment. And then Journal Atlantic also invested in GetGo, which I'm sure you remember that name. And ironically, I was the lawyer representing GA when they invested in GetGo. And there I was, you know, three, four years later as the CEO of a competitor of GetGo. So the world does, uh, does uh, you know, go full circle sometimes. And so Vinny asked me in 2007, after I'd done some legal work for him and his, uh, his uh, predecessor company to, to Virtue was called Madison Tyler, and I did some work for him there, he asked me to leave my law firm, which was, uh, you know, at the time, kind of a difficult thing to do, and join him as his partner starting this business called Virtu Financial in New York. And so that's how I ended up um, sitting on the uh, Skype with you today. <laughs> right. And just for anyone who is unfamiliar, can you just explain briefly what is Virtu in your own words? Sure. So Virtu is really just a further embodiment of what Vinny was doing on the floor of the New York Mercantile Exchange in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, we're an electronic market making firm, and so we make bids and offers and prices across 12,000 different financial instruments in 235 plus markets in 36 different countries, 24 hours a day, five days a week. And we do it across asset classes and geographies. It's pretty much all we do is make make two sided prices. We've evolved a little bit. We have some technology services relationships as well, but. Really, just an old school market maker that's used technology and automation to, uh, I would argue, make the markets better and more efficient and provide two sided prices, connecting natural buyers and sellers and uh, effectively intermediating, intermediating that risk between a natural buyer and a natural seller. And what do you think your preference is for being a market making firm? Like, what's most attractive about the business of market making from the way you see it? First of all, it was all Vinny knew, right? I mean, he was not a, you know, he, he was always a local on the floor of the New York Mercantile Exchange. So his his uh, ethos, his bias was always towards don't take risk and be notional and directional in positions. Don't bet on the direction of, you know, crude when you're in the crude pit, you know, try to make a tick, uh, you know, making a market between a buyer and a seller in the crude pit. So that's, you know, he grew up as a local risking his own capital. And so the, you know, our, our fundamental thesis is that, Despite uh, you know people that write books to the contrary, there's always going to be a need for a financial intermediate, an intermediary. There's always going to be a need for intermediation because the likelihood of buyers and sellers um, being able to trust each other enough to meet in an open and transparent way and have exact contra interest in the size and and price that they want in a particular instrument is pretty unlikely, and so. There's always going to be a need for a market maker. You'll have more efficiencies and whatnot, but at the end of the day, there's always going to be a need for a market maker. And so we built our business around that fundamental premise that what we do in U.S. equities is really no different. In fact, it isn't any different than what we do in Australian equities, right? Obviously, Australia's got a different market structure. It's not nearly as fragmented. You've got some regulatory rules that are different than the U.S., but at the end of the day, there are people in Australia that want to buy in the bid and sell on the offer, and we're there to provide that liquidity, you know, on the on the incumbent exchange and then whatever other competitors pop up. And so we thought that that, that was a more a more sustainable business model and was a business model that investors would ultimately understand and would be enterprisable. And, you know, thus far, nine years into the journey, we've been, you know, I hope proven relatively correct. Yeah, so you said right there, you're nine years into this, you started Virtue in 2008 and you gave some stats just before. You said you're trading in 12,000 instruments, 235 markets and 36 countries all since 2008. How have you been able to fuel such massive growth in less than 10 years? You know what it is, and honestly, a lot of that was early on. It's really just doing one thing and doing it well and just repeating it. In other words, like when you're not... When you don't make money because of some hook, because you're faster than somebody, or you have some access to customer orders, or you have this or you have that. Now, for the record, none of those things are nefarious. None of those things are illegal, right? You know, it's not it's not illegal to buy customer order flow. You know, I just don't have that business. It's not illegal to be really fast between New York and Chicago, right? You know, the, the notion that latency arbitrage is inherently, you know, evil or illegal is just to me silly, right? So it's not like I have a moral or certainly not a legal issue with any of the things that, other, that these other firms do. It's just not 
a sustainable business model because at some point the universe gets more efficient and commoditized and you see it with speed. I mean, you know, people, when we first started this business, you know, going between New York and Chicago, by say New York, I mean the data centers in New Jersey and Chicago was 16 milliseconds round trip, 15.9 to be precise. All right. And then some smart guy said, or, you know what, if I dig through, if I spend a hundred million dollars and dig through the Allegheny mountains, um, I can shave that to, I forgot what spread networks was. So it'll show you how much the work markets evolved. And that's what Michael Lewis wrote his book about spread networks. It isn't, it isn't that evil. It's not evil. It's just commerce, right? Someone smart and figured out that they could sell this to people that wanted to be fast. And then someone said, you know what? Well, you know, data travels through air faster than it travels through fiber. If I create a microwave network that is pretty straight between Carteret, New Jersey, and uh, Aurora, Illinois, that I could sell that to somebody else. And so that's just, you know, how it's evolved. You know, is there going to be, you know, a laser beam or a, a blimp or something else that, that's faster? I don't know. I hope not. But at the end of the day, you know, that's not a, we didn't think that being faster than anybody by a millisecond, a microsecond, a nanosecond was a sustainable business model. That's not to say, unhappily, we, we don't, we have to invest tens and tens of millions of dollars each year in technology to keep up with the, you know, the speed of the market. But at the end of the day, that's not why we make money. Let's talk a little bit about why you do make money. Let's talk about your, your strategies there. So, just explain for us, I think you may have already briefly mentioned this, but from what I understand, Virtue takes no directional trades. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, look, obviously there's risk in what we do. I mean, you know, when we, when the Flash Boys book came out and we had our famous histogram of how we make money every day, you know, there was this natural uh, or unnatural hysteria around that, you know, we must be cheating and this and that. We don't take risk. Of course we take risk, right? We're putting out bids and offers. And if some natural buyer wants to come in and smash the ETF and the futures book, in instruments we're making markets and we're going to lose money. That's the risk of being a market maker, right? So, but what we won't do is, is, you know, by proffering our bids and offers when we are interacted with and we have a position and, uh, obviously we've entered that position because we think we can make a tick, whatever it's a, a penny, an Australian penny or whatever the future increment is in the futures exchange, which we're trading on. We try to make that, that tick. That's our business model, right? you know, buying fives and selling sixes. If it becomes apparent, and this happens quickly, and it's all automated, that, you know, we can't sell sixes, we very quickly try to sell fives. And if we think it's going to go down to four, we'll cross the spread and take a loss. We don't sit there and hold a position, you know, praying for mean reversion, that kind of thing. It's just not how, it's not our DNA. And so it, in that sense, we're not taking directional risk. Around the bid and the offer, if you will, and the price discovery at that increment we are obviously taking a risk. You know, I publicly said uh, many times we trade somewhere between three and a half and four and a half million dollars, four and a half million times per day. Obviously, not 100% of them are profitable. You know, hopefully more than 50% of them are profitable on every given day. And that's why we make money. Yeah, you've also said uh, publicly as well that you have around about a 51 to I think maybe a 52% win rate on average. How are you able to achieve that by not taking uh, directional trades as such? Well, because obviously we're, you know, we're, we're pretty good and pretty smart about where we we're trying to price a particular instrument, right? I mean, there's always going to be a natural price for a particular instrument. We're only going to offer, you know, to buy and sell GE on particular venues because we're looking at the market data and we're thinking, well, you know, we're the, the, the bid side or the offer side is stronger. And so we're going to bias one way or the other. That's just kind of classic market making. And when you're trading a an ETF against a future, um, you know, there's a natural spread, if you will. It's not going to be zero. You know, maybe it's a penny, maybe it's two pennies, if you will, depending upon what the increment is in between those two instruments. So it's the same way, you know, that a market maker would make uh, a profit 30 years ago. We just do it a lot more efficiently and a lot, and a lot faster. Now, there's a criticism. People say, hey, you know, you know, you're not really a market maker, you're not taking risk, you know, blah, blah, blah. I would say, listen, then call us something else. But the notion of somebody holding inventory and saying to customers, okay, I'll buy or I'll sell and I'm willing to take the risk, that just doesn't exist anymore in most asset classes because the reward of being a market maker 
it doesn't offset that risk. So let me be specific. So when you were making a bid offer spread of 25 cents a share in 1982 on the New York Stock Exchange, sure, you could afford to hold more inventory because you would trade a stock, a blue chip, all day and you'd make $25,000. Now you make less than a penny and you are not making $25,000 in any symbol unless you're taking risk. So the reward available to the market maker, the financial intermediary, the whatever you want to call it, the liquidity provider, is completely different. And so as a result, the, the role and function and the behavior of the market maker has evolved to more of, you know, I would argue kind of what we are, which is, you know, a financial intermediary that's using technology to, you know, hopefully process as many transactions as you can. Uh, and at the end of the day, you know, have more winners than losers. The, the most important thing also, it, it, because we, we win 51% of the time, which we have publicly disclosed in certain periods, doesn't mean we're losing 49% of the time. Right. And what we've never disclosed is what's our scratch percentage? When do we break even? We buy fives and we sell fives. Maybe we pay a little bit of fees. But at the end of the day, that's really an important part of of being a more risk averse style market maker. Now, that's a good answer. And can you also explain how the law of large numbers is built into what you do? Because I know that plays a big a big part of virtue. Yeah, it's a funny story. If you Google around about Virtu, all of a sudden there was this article, and I, you know, although I'm, I'm, I do do media, I, I honestly had nothing to do with this one. So this is professor of astrophysics who I've never met. I spoke to him one time after the article came out, uh, who was fascinated by Virtu apparently, and so he pulled up our S one, which is our IPO filing here in the states, and we had some statistics. You you cited them in terms of how many times we trade, how many times we win. And then we said he assumed uh, what our scratch percentage was, and I'm not going to comment whether he was right or wrong and whatnot. And he said, you know, everybody that assumes virtue is cheating and all these people that are all hysterical, Michael Lewis running around with their hair on fire, you're all just wrong. This is just the law of large numbers. If you do something a lot and you win more than you lose, you shouldn't lose money in any day unless you have an operational screw up. And so he said it's basic high school statistics. I never took statistics in high school. He seems like a smart fellow. And he came up with the number, as long as you trade more than 800,000 times a day, he had some assumptions about what our scratch percentage was. He's like, Virtu shouldn't lose money unless they go down or have a blowout or this can, this and that. And there was an article, you know, he got quoted by, I don't even know who the reporter was in the Wall Street Journal. So I called the guy up afterwards and I said, you know, I just want to introduce myself. You seem very fascinated with my firm. And he was, you know, a lovely guy. And he was into, you know, the whole New York to Chicago route because he was a physicist and he was into speed and whatnot. And he was just fascinated by this. And he thought it was, frankly, silly and immature that people couldn't understand that there was a business model that had developed this way. And, yeah, certainly we've got really good risk controls and technology. And, you know, there are, you know it, it, there's a big barrier to entry to what we do. But once you've done it and perfected it, you know, you should be in a position of making money every day. And so I, you know, he described that as the law of large numbers. Again, I'm a liberal arts guy by background. I talked to some of my smart mathematicians and physicists and I said, they said, yeah, it's a good article. The guy's 100% right. Yeah, it is a good article. I have read that. And and what I'll do for anyone listening to this podcast is I'll put a link to that in the show notes at chatwithtraders.com so you can uh, find it there if, if you also want to read that. Now, you started Virtue in 2008. So, you know, we're talking nine years ago, have you noticed the space that you operate in becoming more crowded, more competitive in any way? And how are you guys dealing with that? Yeah, it's a great question. So we we started in 2008. In 2011, just just so um, you're clear, we actually combined with a predecessor firm that Vinny still owned a significant interest in. He was not active in it, a firm called Madison Tyler, which was a pretty big, and they kind of did what we did. And so, you know, we, we consolidated it and became bigger and it, it kind of helped jumpstart some of our development. But, you know, certainly there are firms that existed then that don't exist now that have tried to get into this business. And there's been, you know, a handful of firms that have announced they're either getting out of uh, the space because, you know, the, the margins, what I'll say is the margins on an individual basis, an individual strategy, an asset class are very, very challenging. Like if you want to be a U.S. equities electronic market maker, let's just suppose, 
you know, we spent, and this is all public information, we spent about $70 million last year on our technology market data infrastructure, right? That's, you know, in the public information in our 10K. Now, a lot of that was for our U.S. setup, right? Because NASDAQ and New York are, too, are very expensive in terms of COLA and market data. And, you know, we have to have that the connections and redundancy between New York and Chicago. we got to be at the ICE Intercontinental Exchange Data Center in Chicago and, and the CME in Aurora. And there's at least three data centers and there's a couple smaller ones in Carteret. So all that costs a lot of money. That infrastructure and footprint you need for U.S. equities. Okay. If we were only running U.S. equities P&L through there, you can look at our, you know, the 400 odd million dollars in net trading revenue we generated last year. And you can kind of do the math and figure out how much of that, because we disclose it, is U.S. equities. It's somewhere between 25 and 30 percent. I forget the exact number. And then if you take those fixed costs and say, well, a good chunk of those are allocable to being, you know, to the United States. And then I'm not, you know, obviously you need people and you need licenses and you need a broker dealer. If we were just a U.S. equities market maker, it wouldn't work. We wouldn't be we wouldn't be profitable. The secret to our business is that there's not a secret. It's just a scaled business. That same infrastructure I described to you, we use for FX. We use for metals. Indeed, we use for a lot of our trading around the world because there's a lot of futures listed on the CME that are relevant in Japan and, and in Brazil, for example. And so it's enabled us to grow. There are firms that have started and tried to be U.S. equities market maker that haven't made it. There are firms that relied, I would argue, largely on speed or largely on a, a real volatile market that have seen their profits uh, you know, dwindle. And the costs of maintaining that infrastructure I described, I think we're pretty efficient. You know, We've got 235-ish venues that we connect to and all the – you know, the data centers all around the world and all the servers and whatnot that we have to buy. And so we spend 70 million bucks a year. It's kind of been, you know, a big barrier to entry. And also uh, it's made it more challenging for what I'll say is smaller firms to, you know, be successful. So you've seen some consolidation. There's a firm called Chopper that kind of folded up shop and sold some of his assets. Uh, Tesla Technologies has announced their getting out of the HFT game and going to become more of an asset manager. In fact, we have a deal to buy some of their telecommunications assets. So these are good firms that were, you know, based in Chicago, New York, or whatever it is that are, that are either folding up or, or selling their assets. So I, I think you've, you're going to see a further consolidation uh, in this space. It's just not, it's not that easy to be, you know, meaningfully profitable on a, on a grand scale. Yeah, and I like how you describe it as a scale business. I think that's very cool. And, and one of the reasons you're able to do that is because you have very good risk controls and your ability to manage risk. On the counter to that, what are some of the what are the sort of potential risks a firm like Virtue could be vulnerable to? Well, look, I mean, there's you know, obviously we we can't believe our own BS, right? There, we're connected to a lot of different venues around the world. I don't want to insult anybody, but we're, we're subject to the lowest common denominator of technology in the world, right? Uh, the trading world. And so when we put out, we put out bids and offers, that's real risk, right? I mean, we, we trade a lot, 4 million times a day. You can only imagine how many orders we're putting out there, right? It's multiples of that, many, many, many multiples of that. And so we have to be very cognizant of the acknowledgement, if you will, and the management of those orders in a way that is that is seamless. And human beings have to do that. You cannot rely on, you know, technology alone to do that because a human's got to react and say, hey, we put out this order, we haven't we haven't seen it. Or on the contrary, you can have a situation where, you know, your algorithm is screwing up. It keeps it's mispriced something. It keeps sending an order on one side of the book. You know, it's lost a lot of money. It's made too much money. It's not designed to make a lot of money. Maybe it's, you know, missed mispriced a spread. And so we're very cognizant of that, and we've sacrificed, uh, you know, latency by having a lot of pre-trade risk controls. But we also have a lot of what I would say are real-time post-trade risk controls, where we're doing real-time, you know, house versus street reconciliations to manage that risk. Again, I come back to when you have a singular mission, you know, posting bids and offers. When you have a single platform, if you will, a single engine that is multi-asset class, multi-currency, which virtue is when you don't have pods, uh, you don't have, you know, trading pods. It's really just one open environment where everybody kind of collaborates and sees, you know, kind of where, 
what the firm is trading and what the reaction times are and whatnot. You know, that will mitigate the risk. At the end of the day, though, look, you know, we, you know, we can't believe our own press clippings, right? We spend a lot of time and a lot of money always trying to improve. And, you know, hubris is a horrible, horrible vice. And so we always live by the credo that there but the grace of God go I. So risk controls are really, really important here. And when you own and operate and manage a very large integrated technology firm like we all do, you know, we have to be really vigilant uh, to ensure that, you know, uh, we don't have material losses. Okay, just a quick time out. Firstly, I want to thank our sponsor, TradeStation, the trusted online broker and technology provider for thousands of active traders, both in the professional and retail space, providing them with direct access to equities, ETFs, futures, and options. But one thing that should pique your attention is the sweet deal TradeStation are offering to new clients. Let me break it down for you. $5 $5 stock trades, no platform fees, free real-time data, free radar screen scanner, and free use of Portfolio Maestro and Option Station Pro. So, lots of free stuff and pretty much no fees. Essentially, the only thing you pay is 5 bucks when you make a trade. Visit tradestation.com slash traders to learn more and get set up with a new trading account. To repeat, that's tradestation.com slash traders and just hit up their support team if you have any questions. Also supporting this episode is IRS Medic. IRS Medic is a tax firm founded by a father and son combo who, funny enough, graduated law school alongside one another. Their priority is to make sure you're being 100% tax compliant, whether that be in a business deal in the operations of your business, or even in your own individual taxes. Because as we're well aware, the IRS can hit you with nasty penalties for technical violations. IRS Medic are the tax firm that understand the entrepreneurial mindset and know your energies are better spent elsewhere. With IRS Medic in your corner, you have a firm with core competencies and proven systems to solve the most difficult tax issues. So, protect yourself from IRS headaches. Go to irsmedic.com slash traders and get help with your tax challenges today. In case you didn't catch it, the link to visit is irsmedic.com slash traders. Now, you know, we've kind of spoken about this a little bit, but Virtue went public, um, listed on the NASDAQ in April 2015. During the IPO process, it was released that you guys had one losing day in five years, which, you know, you, you, I think you might have brought that up just before. And that one losing day was due to operational error, not so much strategy. Since this info came out, are you able to comment on how many losing days Virtue has had since? Well, I'll tell you why I can't, okay, because um – I put that in there and it was entirely my fault because I thought it was going to be well-received, not because we were an arrogant, cocky firm that never lost money and we were cheating and ripping everybody off a la, uh, oh my God, I blanked on his name, Michael Lewis in Flash Boys. See, Uh, he's out of my consciousness. I forgot his name. Uh, You know, I, I put it in there because I wanted to show everybody, look, we don't, we're not swinging for the fences. I don't know if you if you follow American baseball, but I assume you do. We're a firm. I'm a sports guy. We hit singles, right? There's no shit. You'll score a lot. I said this to my son who's a baseball player. You'll make a, a lot of runs if you get walks and singles. You don't have to hit a grand slam. That may look good, but if you hit a lot of singles, you'll make money. So the idea was let's show people over a prolonged period, not that we didn't lose money, that the P&L, the net trading revenue associated with this firm, was really tightly packed in a range on most days and that there would be some outsized days where there was extreme levels of volatility or surprise announcements. The U.S. government gets de- downgraded by S&P, whatever it is, where we're going to make a lot more money. But for the line share of days, we're going to be between X and Y. And so statistically, you could say, OK, well, I, I know these guys are telling us they don't take risks. They're market makers. But how do I know they don't make four million dollars one day and lose two million dollars the other day? That was the virtuous reason we, we disclosed this. Okay, the world went crazy, and I spent a lot of time talking about this 
stupid histogram, and I regretted that I put it out there because it created all this nonsense. You know, the guys at Zero Hedge going crazy, writing a whole bunch of just crap, to be honest with you, and nonsense. And I said, you know what? This is stupid, right? The world's changed a lot since then, but this is stupid. It's not really adding any value to the conversation. And so I vowed that I would never, ever disclose it again, and I haven't. So long-winded answer. You're not going to get it out of me. (laughs) <laughs> no, that completely makes sense. And I mean, you know, for anyone, if they actually understand the law of large numbers and they understand how much volume and how many trades you're taking, it, you know, it just kind of makes sense. Like it, it works out that way statistically, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I appreciate you saying that. I, I would say in fairness to the universe, because I try to be a fair guy, I think people didn't really get that. And then unfortunately, you know, Michael Lewis came out with this book that might have been might have described the market in, in 2009. It didn't describe the market in 2015. He didn't really know what the hell he was talking about. And at the end of the day, it was irresponsible what he did. I don't blame him. He's an author. He's a fictionalist. He, you know, is anti-money. He's anti-Wall Street. You know, all that kind of stuff. I get it. I don't begrudge him making his money. You know, he's ultimately he's a capitalist dressed up like a uh, dressed up like a communist. And uh, oh, that's going to get me in trouble. I don't care. At the end of the day. You know, when people really got under the covers and looked at this firm in 2015, 2016, and now in 2017, they completely get it. It's why we've announced that we're in collaboration and partnership with, you know, JP Morgan, right? They wouldn't be doing business with us if they thought there was something nefarious going on. So the world's evolved beyond all that nonsense. I think ultimately, and this is, you're going to be surprised to hear this, Michael Lewis did us a huge favor. By writing his, you know, fictionalized nonsense, he forced people and us saying, guys, that's just not true. We didn't do that publicly. We said it privately, come on in and look at our firm. He forced people, market participants, to actually take a look at what these firms were doing. And not just Virtu. We don't have a monopoly on, you know, uh, trading and excellence. You know, there are a lot of great firms that do this. He forced people to look at it and say, maybe there's a different way of doing this. And as a result, there's a lot of great firms now that have benefited because – you know, investors, large, you know, large banks, folks on the buy side, look at this and say, you know, maybe this actually can help the market. Maybe the markets have gotten more efficient. Maybe guys like this that are efficient about risk transference are better than the old way we used to do this. And so at the end of the day, and regulators the same way, right? I mean, we had the SEC and FINRA and the CFTC and the FSA and, and uh, uh, ASIC and a whole bunch of other folks into Virtu, we, sh- we completely opened Kimono with them and said, guys, we got nothing to hide. All right. I don't want to talk about this book. I don't know if it's true or false. It doesn't have anything to do with my firm. And this is what we do. We think we add a lot of value. Are we perfect? No. Do we get fined occasionally? Of course we do. A lot of rules we got to follow. Sometimes we have, you know, traffic tickets and foot faults and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, this is a firm that's here to stay. And it's very important to the ecosystem. That was the conclusion that I think 99 people out of 100 that have come in here reach that have reached that conclusion. So 2017 has a much different feel to it than 2014, thankfully. Let's step aside from markets now. You've done extremely well for yourself. What does it take to reach such levels of success as an entrepreneur? Um, you know, you own the, the Florida Panthers, you CEO and co-founder of Virtue. What are some of the things you've done differently to get to where you're at today? You know, the honest answer is, you know, like everybody says, I I was, I guess, a reasonably smart young man, more liberal arts than math or science, ironically. I did work my ass off uh, to get good grades in high school. I got into a really good college here in the United States called Columbia. Very proud of that. I did really well in college. I went to a really good law school. Because of that, I went to work at one of the top law firms. And then when I got to a law firm, I worked my ass off because I wanted to become a partner. And more importantly, I kept my eyes open. And just learned a lot about a lot of different things. And so I'm, I'm pretty well rounded. And because of that, I got, you know, some really great clients, you know, customers. And I worked on some really, you know, top flight deals. If you Google my, you know, deal life, I don't even remember, you know, half of them, but I did a lot of like, you know, big M&A deals and all that kind of stuff. So I got exposed to a lot of stuff as a lawyer. And because of that, I met, you know, this unbelievably talented creative entrepreneur guy uh, named Vinny Viola. We became really good friends and, you know, he opened my eyes to a lot of things and I think I helped him a lot. We worked really well together. So the moral of the story is 
you know, you got to have, first you got to work your ass off. You got to have some innate ability, but look, I'm no genius. This is, you know, I'm the dumbest guy at Virtu. I'm proud to say that. I interview everybody that comes in this firm. I took the same written IQ test that all of our traders and developers take. If they don't score higher than me, they can't be hired here, right? Because I got to be the dumbest guy here. And, you know, to have the confidence to be able to hire really smart people and empower them, I think that's why we've been successful. So you got to be smart. You got to work hard. You got to have, you know, decent people skills, I think, to have that. And you got to be modest enough to, to, to know what you don't know and to, you know, gather around you in a very virtuous and fair way people that can, you know, will add more to the institution than take away and will help you create a great business. You know, that, I think that's really been, you know, people marvel at our culture. They only have 140, whatever it is, people. And there are, you know, competitors at 500, 600, 800. It's because we don't, there's no politics here. It's a flat organization and we empower really great people, really smart people to, you know, uh, as Vinny would say, to actualize their potential. And I really do believe in that. So that's really been, if I could say, what's the key to my success? It's just been, you know, hard work. A lot of, you know, uh, you know, a lot of good people along the way helped me out a lot. And ultimately, you know, uh, you know, just putting my nose to the grindstone in 2008 to learn a business. To be honest with you, I had really no clue about anything when it came to financial into you know, the financial markets other than as a lawyer. And I didn't know EBS from eSpeed. I used to like on my desk, I would write down like little cheat sheets because when I would talk to people, I'd be like, okay, is eSpeed the fixed income one again or is that EBS? And then I couldn't remember like, you know, the symbols for each of them, you know, all the ex expirations for all the futures. I'm just not a, I wasn't built that way. And so, you know, I, just like I was a first year associate of getting in the law firm, I was the CEO of a firm, but I was the dumbest guy here and I really had to learn it from the ground up. And that's what I did. Yeah. And that's what I find so incredible about your story, Doug, is that, you know, you did 17, 18 years as a lawyer left that, went and started something totally different. You know, you started Virtue with Vinny and, you know, you're now one of the biggest market makers in, in the world and you've reached that level within a very short period of time. You know what? Here's the thing I would say is you, you can't, titles are absolute bullshit, right? It doesn't mean anything. I was a lawyer. Yeah, so what? You know what I mean? I'm a smart guy. That's the same thing I have around here. Like, we don't have titles for people, not because, you know, we're this is some like, great Harvard Business School case study on how to you know, run a company. It's because I think they limit people, right? Like if people just said, oh, he's just a lawyer, and they would kind of like poo-poo me, I don't really care at the end of the day because it doesn't affect my life. But you know what? I'm a smart guy. I can figure it out. Same thing like on the hockey side. People are like, well, you don't know anything about hockey. I said, well, you know, I'm a pretty smart guy. You know, show me some data statistics. Maybe I can figure some stuff out. That's kind of, you know, kind of how Vinny and I look at things. And, you know, give Vinny all the credit in the world. He was willing to take a risk on a guy that, you know, the rest of the universe would have said, well, look, he's a really great corporate lawyer, but is he really a businessman? Can he really figure this stuff out? And Vinny was, I guess the word is courageous enough to, uh, you know, take the risk on a loudmouth lawyer like myself. I love it, man. That's awesome. On that note, Doug, let's call this a wrap. If anyone listening wants to follow you or find out more, where is the best place to go? Well, we have a website. It's not the greatest website in the world, but we are a public company, so we got a website, and there's obviously 10K. And then um, uh, my email address is pretty easy. It's dcifu at virtu, V-I-R-T-U dot com. Okay. And you're also on Twitter as well. What's your Twitter handle? Well, this is really embarrassing. I have to say it, I guess. It's at Dougie Large, and not because I'm um, like some rich guy. It's because... I'm a little overweight, and I had a client years ago used to say, hey, Dougie Large, the man in charge, and I thought that was kind of funny. So <laughs> It's kind of catchy. Cool, man. I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well as the other things you mentioned. Doug, I really do appreciate you taking the time to come on Chat with Traders podcast. Thank you very much. All right. No problem, my friend. Good luck with everything you do. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders. But rest assured, there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes. And we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders.